Welcome back to Almost a True Crime Podcast, a product of Bitch Pack Media. We are your hosts, Taryn and Madison. Listener discretion is advised due to the mature content and the amount of cuss words we say. You've been warned. Hey, guys. Hey. That was very perky. I know, because I keep going, hey, guys. <laughs> so I decided I would not Switch do it that up. this time. <laughs> you decided against that. Yeah. Give them something new, you know, something, something fresh. fresh. Mm. I don't like it when we do the same thing. Me either. <laughs> All right, we have nothing to talk about because we were just here. Recorded. Literally, we haven't moved. <laughs> <laughs> Recorded right off the heels of Adrian Reynolds. So I guess we can just get started. Take it away. <sighs> Give it away, give it away, give it away. <laughs> you ever get your tickets to Nickelback? No. <laughs> Nickelback is a concert I want to black out at. Fuck yeah. Like, <laughs> but who are they with? They're with like some country person, I think. Ew, why? I'm like, ugh, I don't know. I'm like, dude, <laughs> I would live at a Nickelback concert. <laughs> I want them to play like Animals by Nickelback and I'll just sing every fucking word. For God. I love that song. <laughs> Isn't like wildly inappropriate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I think I was in seventh grade when I heard the song for the first time because my cousin played it for me and I listened. I know every single word. Change your life. It did. See, there's another thing that I was too young to be listening to that probably changed the course <laughs> of who I became as a person. That's so funny. I can't tell who they're going on tour with. I can't remember. I'll tell you in five seconds. <laughs> I get that. Nickelback doesn't have like an official Instagram. <laughs> what a Nickelback thing to do. That's weird. I don't know any of the people's names in Nickelback either. Chad Kruger. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Remember when him and Avril Lavigne dated? Were they married? I, oh, Brantley Gilbert. That's who they're. Oh, that is weird. No. I don't want to be there for that. Me either. I didn't know that him. I don't really know anything about Avril Lavigne, honestly. Okay, well, I was except an that Lavigne she. Stan. I, yeah, I loved her music, but I didn't like. I don't know. I feel like I don't really know much about her, except she's Canadian, and she maybe died and has like a replacement <laughs> out there, but we don't know. That's jury's out on that one. Yep, we'll never know. <laughs> okay, I'm doing the case. Of Andrea Yates today. Oh my God. Uh, I know, been a long time coming. It's very prevalent right now. I know, I thought that. I don't remember that lady's name. People are being Lindsay weirdly Clancy, I think. nice to her. Or like sympathetic to the situation that she has inserted herself in. I See, I don't know. I have weird feelings about it. We can speak about it at the end after we hear okay. what happened to Andrea Yates. Yeah, I don't know the full story of this one, honestly. It's fucked up. So... Andrea Yates was born Andrea Pia Kennedy, which Pia is such a cute name. I love that name. Pia? Andrea Pia Kennedy. I would have never changed my name to Andrea Yates. She's very religious. I would keep Kennedy forever, too. Forever. What a fabulous last name. It's the perfect last name. You can't beat it. You can't. Kennedy. I would also make up some crazy story about how I'm related to the (laughs) Kennedys. So she was born on July 2nd, 1964 in Houston, Texas. She was the youngest of five children to Jetta Karen Kohler, a German in- immigrant, and Andrew Emmett Kennedy, whose parents were born in Ireland. Yates was raised in a Catholic household. It's going to be very obvious. Andrea, by all accounts, was like a very good student. She was valedictorian of her high school. She was on the National Honor Society. She was captain of her swim team, like all of that shit. That always blows my mind. There are kids that just really be out there, like, doing it all. Yeah, she's, like, one of those kids who was good at everything. <sighs> Couldn't and, be me. No, could never be me. I'm lucky I made it to, like, where I did. And that's still not that great. Honestly, same. <laughs> it had been said, however, that she did struggle from an eating disorder and suicidal ideations even as far back as high school. Oh. If you know anything about this case, you know as pertinent information. She graduated from Milby High School in Houston, Texas in 1982. She then completed a two-year pre-nursing program at the University of Houston and graduated from the University of Texas School of Nursing. From 1986 to 1994, she worked as a registered nurse 
at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. While working at the center, she meets Russell Yates at their apartment building. He goes by Rusty after this. Andrea, who was usually reserved, initiated the conversation with they, when they met at their apartment complex. Andrea had never dated anyone until she turned 23, and prior to meeting Rusty, she was healing from a broken relationship. So, like, she had, like, dated, like, one person she before had, this. Yeah, okay. They eventually moved in together and spent much of their time involved in religious study and prayer. Like you just talked about, wow. you felt what if you were religious. I don't know if that's what, like, <laughs> our relationship was. Yeah, well, that's a real thing, apparently. Yeah. They were both 25, extremely religious. So, like, this is like a match made in literal heaven. So, you think they're probably not having sex? Probably not right now. Which, like, we just talked about in the Randy Stone episode. Like, it has to be so hard to find someone who, like, seriously aligns with yeah. all of your beliefs. Right. Like, this was them. Like, they were and all be all. They soon were married on April 17th, 1993. They vowed to have as many children as God allowed. Oh, yeah. Very Duggar energy. Like, no just birth because control. you can, doesn't does that mean you should? should? Probably not. That sounds like, like a okay, not great you don't need idea. to release every load inside of you. No, you don't need, you don't need to do that. Like, every time you might be getting pregnant? Yeah. Why? And that's fine. Because like, who can, who? Because it's what God wants at that time. And if God wants you to have 17 children, then you should. Okay. Because you can. Could it, that could literally never be me. mm Afterwards, they bought a four-bedroom house in the town of Friendswood. Friendswood is actually pretty close to where my family lives in the Galveston Woodlands area, but it's, like, still basically Houston. They still live Mm -hmm. in Houston. In February of 1994, the couple's first child, a son named Noah, was born. Shortly thereafter, Rusty accepted a job offer in Florida, so the family relocated to a small trailer in Seminole, Florida. They had another son, John, in December of 1995. Damn. Like, popping them out quick. While in Florida, Andrea got pregnant but miscarried. By the birth of their third son, Paul, in 1997, they settled back to Houston and purchased a GMC motorhome because he wanted to live light, eventually purchasing a 350-square-foot bus, which became their permanent home. Oh, my God. Permanent. With, as of now, two adults and three toddlers in a 350-square-foot Yeah, bus. I'm going to pass on that, but yeah. okay. So, Rusty gets the idea to live light and gets the actual bus from evangelicist Michael Warrenecke. Rusty first met Warrenecke preaching at Auburn University in Alabama, where he was a student. Rusty later introduced the preacher to Andrea. During a 1994 protest at Brigham Young University in Utah, Warrenecke branded the school's women contemporary witches, telling them sarcastically, go and be a 20th century career woman and forget about your families. What? This man has a whack job. And one of his pamphlets declared, as man was created to dominate, God reveals that woman was created to be his helpmate, which literally means someone who's meant to help. Like, women were only created to help men. There's, like, no other reason why they should be here. Okay. Yes. Rusty agreed with the preacher's support for homeschooling and living the simple life in a bus. Warrenecke believed in and preached that true righteousness could only come from living extremely simple and bare. Like, just what you need to survive. Like, you don't need a house. You don't, like, this man is crazy. Mm -hmm. However, psychiatrist per year says adopting such practices had caused Andrea significant stress. Her family was concerned by the way that she was so captivated by the minister's words. Like, she's taking everything he's saying as fact. Oh, my God. Like, this, this is like is, cult. This is a man of God. He's saying things that have to be true. Like, this is all right. true. You can't make this up. No. And she did, in fact, have significant stress. Also, she is extremely isolated. Well, yeah. So she seems has like no that. friends. And they live in a bus. They live in a bus. She only talks to, like, her family, or Rusty and her toddlers. Yeah. Andrea was convinced, as she had heard Warnecke preach, that women derived from sin and that hell-bound mothers would see their children burn in hell. What? So, yeah, she's like, well, women are inherently bad, and if you're a bad mom, by default, your kids go to hell. So. Okay. Um, 
She would later say it was the seventh deadly sin. My children weren't righteous. They stumbled because I was evil. The way I was raising them, they could never be saved. They were doomed to perish in the fires of hell. So he has convinced her, whether he meant to or not, that she has made some mistakes in the raising of her children. And no matter what, they're all burning in hell. Yeah, and that means, like, she's not raising them right, and by default, they have to go to hell because of what she is doing. Okay. By the time her fourth son, Luke, was born in 1999, Andrea was suffering from a complete mental breakdown, which we know in today's day and age as postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis, Mm -hmm. which was... Not that they didn't know about it back then, but if anyone is not going to be looking into it, it's these people. Yeah. Yeah. They're not, <laughs> yeah. My sock is fucking crooked. I can't do you that. You freak out. The seam. Oh, God. Okay. Socks are a daily fight every morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So they then prescribed her trazodone after Luke was born. Damn. Because she'd be going through it. This is her fourth child, right? Yeah. On June 16th, 1999, Rusty found Andrea shaking and chewing her fingers. The next day, she attempted to commit suicide by overdosing on her trazodone pills. She was admitted to the hospital and prescribed antidepressants. She was transferred to the Methodist Hospital Psychiatric Unit and diagnosed with major depressive disorder. The medical staff described Andrea as evasive in discussing her problems. However, on June 24th, she was prescribed an antidepressant and was released. Once she got home, she stopped taking the medication. Oh, my gosh. Which is not that shocking. Giving yeah. her home life, I could see Rusty saying, like, she doesn't need it. Don't take that because it's going <laughs> to poison you. Yes. He even, I didn't put it in here, but in later interviews, it had come out that, like, he thought, like, he said, like, depressed people just need, like, a swift kick in the pants. Like, one of those. Like, you're just sad. Like, just don't be so just sad. Get over it. There's yeah. people out there who have it worse. <laughs> so she stopped taking her medication. And immediately reverted back to how she was before. Because mm-hmm. medication works. Correct. <laughs> so You have to take it. Yeah. So when she didn't, she was right back to where she was before. She wouldn't feed the children because she thought they were eating too much food and that wasn't a good way to live or to get into heaven. Like, they're eating too much. We can't be feeding them this much. She was convinced that there were cameras in the ceiling oh, and no. that characters on TV were speaking directly to her children. She told Rusty about the hallucinations Yet, neither of them informed Andrea's psychiatrist, Dr. Starbranch. On July 20th, Andrea put a knife to her neck and begged her husband to let her die. Andrea was again hospitalized and stayed in a catonic state for 10 days. Damn. Catatonic. Catonic? Does it matter? I don't know, actually. I'm not sure. (laughs) Me either. After being treated with an injection of different drugs that included Haldol, an antipsychotic drug, her condition immediately improved. Yeah, like... She needs an antipsychotic. Yes. It's very clear. Rusty was optimistic about the drug therapy because Andrea appeared more like the person he had first met. So she's like, the world of a difference Mm -hmm. this has made for her. Her first psychiatrist, Dr. Eileen Starbrands, testified that she urged the couple not to have more children as it would guarantee future psychotic depression. Yeah. She's like, listen, this is the cause. If you do this again, we're going to be right back. It's freezing in my basement. Andrew was placed on outpatient care and prescribed Haldol at home. Dr. Eileen Starbranch said that she found Yates among the five sickest patients she had ever had. Andrew's family urged Rusty to buy a home instead of returning Andrea to the cramped space of the bus. Yeah, like she needs like some yeah, room. We need to move. He purchased a nice home in a peaceful neighborhood. Once in her new home, her condition improved to the point where she returned to like swimming, cooking, talking to people, okay. like a full yeah. new person. She was also interacting well with her children. She expressed to Rusty that she had strong hopes for the future, but still viewed her life on the bus as her failure. She's like, I'm doing great now, but that was terrible. Yeah. That was a fail. I failed at that. I failed at living light and the love of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Despite all of that, they conceived their fifth and final child approximately seven weeks after her discharge. That meant that Jesus. Andrea stopped taking the Haldol that made her oh, better God. by March of 2000 and gave birth to their fifth child, Mary, on November 30th, 2000. Andrea was coping, but on March 12th, 2001, her father died, and immediately her mental state went to shit. She, ta- she stopped talking. She refused liquids. She, had, she was mutilating herself. She would not feed Mary. She also friend frantically read the bible 
By the end of March, Andrea returned to a different hospital. On March 28, 2001, Russell contacted Dr. Starbranch and told her that Andrea was sick again. Dr. Starbranch wanted to see Andrea immediately, but Russell said he could not bring her in until next Monday. Andrea was not taken to Dr. Starbranch's office then, but she was admitted to Devereux Hospital in League City on March 31, 2001. There she was observed as being catatonic or nearly catatonic and possibly delusional or having bizarre thoughts, Mm -hmm. which we already know is true. She thinks there are cameras in her house. She was treated by Dr. Mohammed Saeed and was placed on a suicide watch. She was discharged on April 13th, 2001 at Rusty's and her own request, but I'm assuming it was mostly his. Mm -hmm. She began an outpatient program at Devereux and Dr. Saeed recommended that someone stay with her at all times and that she not be left alone with her children. Yeah. So at this point, there's like, it does not She is a danger. At all. Yes. A literal danger. Do not leave her alone with your children. I don't get then, like, why is she allowed to be home? Yes. Why is she allowed to leave? That's what doesn't make sense to me. No. On April 19th, Rusty's mother came for a visit. She had intended to stay for about a week, but when Rusty told her what was going on with Andrea, and, like, she could obviously see Andrea, she decided to stay longer. Yeah. And she moved to a nearby extended stay hotel. She went to their home every day. She observed that Andrea was almost catatonic. She did not respond to conversation or made a delayed response. She stared into space. She trembled. She scratched her head until she created bald spots, and she did not eat. On May 3rd, Andrea filled a bathtub with water but could not give a good reason for doing so. When asked, she said, I might need it. On May 4th, she was immediately readmitted to Devereaux. And on May 14th, she was discharged, seeming to be better. Dr. Saeed had prescribed the medication Haldol, and she continued to take it after her discharge. He also recommended um, electroconvulsive therapy. That's so crazy. But they obviously rejected that. She could barely take medication. She's yeah. Like, That's too. She's definitely not going to <laughs> yeah, no. do shock therapy. No, absolutely not. After her second discharge from Devereaux, Andrea was able to take care of her children, but was still uncommunicative and withdrawn. She smiled infrequently and seemed to have no emotions. But Rusty did not think it was unsafe to leave her alone with children. He was like, this is probably fine. On June 4th, Andrea had a follow-up appointment with Dr. Saeed who decided to taper her off Haldol. Oh, my God. Yeah. Andrea denied having any suicidal or psychotic thoughts, which is, just, she's not someone who is to be trusted. Right. With her, she's she's probably lying. Yes. Or she probably believes that and it is not true, because the second you take her off this medication, it's going to be exactly the same. Yeah, as has been proven. Yes. So she's no longer taking Haldol, and Dr. Said adjusted the dosage of her other antidepressant medications. So they're, like, taping her off everything. For what reasoning? I have literally no idea. I don't get why. If it's working, why stop? (laughs) Literally. If it's working, that means it's working. It doesn't mean, like, you're better. No, it means you need to continue. Yeah. It means this is what you should be doing for a very long time. (laughs) I've learned anything. (laughs) (laughs) If you've learned anything, you don't taper yourself off your depressed, depressive medications. So, on June 20th, 2011, Rusty left for work at about 9 a.m., and her mother-in-law wasn't coming until 10 a.m., so he knows he's leaving Andrea alone for an hour, despite the urgency that she not be alone with her children for any amount of time. Mm -hmm. He's like, this is probably fine. That one hour would prove to be fatal for all five of her children. Andrea waited for Rusty to leave so he wouldn't ask any questions and then filled the bathtub with several inches of cold water. She locked up the family dog so that it wouldn't interfere with what she was doing and proceeded to commit one of the most talked about crimes probably I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. Starting with her younger sons, she carried them upstairs, held their heads underwater, and drowned them. After each child, she carried their bodies to her room and placed them on her bed. She drowned Luke, Paul, and John first. She then carried six-month-old Mary upstairs and drowned her. She left Mary's body in the bathtub when Noah came in and asked what was wrong with Mary. He then ran, but she soon caught up with him. Noah was obviously the most difficult to drown because he was the strongest. Yeah. Noah managed to get his head above water and say, I'm sorry. She left his body in the bathtub for some reason. Maybe he was too heavy to carry. I'm not sure why she wouldn't have also moved him. Yeah. But she then took Mary's body out of the bathtub and placed her in John's arms because he was always a good brother and he could protect her in the afterlife. At 9.48 a.m., Andrea calmly called 911 and told the operator, Sylvia Morris, that she needed the police. 
Morris transferred the call to the Houston Police Department, and Andrea told the police operator that she needed a police officer to come to her home. So the dispatcher says, what's your name? She says, Andrea Yates. They say, what's the problem? She says, I just need him to come. The dispatcher says, your husband there? She says, no. He says, well, what's the problem? She said, I need him to come. They said, I need to know why we're coming, ma'am. Is he there standing next to you? She said, no. And he said, is she standing next to you? She said, what? Like, I think she's acting so weird. They think she's trying to, like, secretly place a call. Yeah. Like, are they next to you? She's like, what are you talking about? Like, they think (laughs) she's in trouble. Yes. Someone said, are you having a disturbance? Are you ill? She said, yes, I'm ill. Dispatcher said, do you need an ambulance? She said, no, I need a police officer. And then she said, actually, yes, send an ambulance. So that's a problem. She said, I just need a police officer. Like, she did not say anything on the yeah. one call. Andrea also called Rusty at work and told him that he needed to come home, but would not say why. Oh, my God. As he was leaving, he called her and asked if anyone was hurt, and she said that the kids were hurt, and he asked which ones, and she said all of them. Oh, my God. Isn't that crazy? One hour. One hour. He left for work, and his whole world is different. You should have not left her alone. Within minutes of her 911 call, several police officers arrived at the home. They discovered four dead children soaking wet and covered with a sheet lying on her bed. The fifth child, Noah, was still in the bathtub, floating face down. Andrea was quiet and cooperative with the police officers. She immediately confessed that she was the woman who drowned her kids, and she even explained that she waited for her husband to leave before committing them and that she had locked the dog in the kennel to keep him from interfering. George Parnum, a lawyer hired by a family friend, took on her defense. After police arrested Andrea Yates, she told psychiatrist Dr. Philip Resnick that her children would not grow up to be righteous. She believed killing them before they turned sinful had saved them from hell, and that only her own execution for killing them would defeat Satan on earth. So her plan is, like, I have to kill them, and then I have to get them to kill me, Mm -hmm. and it's the only way we can all go to heaven. Yep, okay. Andrea believed that Satan was within her and tormented her and the children. She thought that after she drowned her children, she would be arrested and executed. She indicated that Satan would be executed along with her. She believed it was right to drown her children because she wanted to save their souls and didn't want them to be in Satan's hands. Although the defense expert testimony agreed that Yates was psychotic, Texas law requires that in order to successfully assert the insanity defense, the defendant must prove that he or she could not discern right from wrong at the time of the crime. And we, Andrea knew what she was doing was wrong, but she thought it was necessary. It's like, they can't use an insanity defense, they're saying, because Andrea was aware what she was doing was wrong. Just because she believed she needed to do it doesn't yeah. mean that she was insane. Okay. Resnick diagnosed Yates with schizoaffective disorder, severe depression with schizophrenic symptoms, She had been variously diagnosed along the way with postnatal psychosis, major depression, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, and combination of these conditions with postnatal psychosis generally accepted as the most definitive. So that's what she had going on. Yeah. While in prison, Andrea stated that she had considered killing children for two years, adding that they thought she was not a good mother and claimed her sons were developing improperly. Um, that's when she told her jail psychiatrist that they stumbled because I was evil. They could never be saved. She also told her jail psychiatrist that Satan influenced her children and made them more disobedient. Okay. According to court documents, at trial, 10 psychiatrists and two psychologists testified regarding Andrea's mental illness. Four of the psychiatrists and one of the psychologists had treated her either in a medical facility or as a private patient before she murdered her children. So they had been mm-hmm. familiar with her before they testified regarding the symptoms severity and treatment of her mental illness five psychiatrists and one psychologist saw appellant on or soon after she murdered her children four of these psychiatrists and the psychologist testified that on june 20th 2001 andrea did not know right from wrong and was incapable of knowing what she did was wrong or believe that her acts were right The fifth psychiatrist in this group, Dr. Melissa Ferguson, testified that she had not made a determination regarding Andrea's ability to know whether her actions were wrong. However, she testified that Andrea made the statement that, in the context that the children would perish in the fires of hell and the drowning was the right thing to do, which is basically what we said earlier. The root of the issue is that Andrea knows what she did was wrong, but she believes it was justified in an insane way. Yeah. So, like, how can you not... 
the basic thing, like, yeah, the, according to the law, probably not an insanity defense because she knew what she was doing was wrong. Yeah. But can you please look at what's going on here as yeah. a whole? That's, yeah. The 10th psychiatrist, Dr. Park Dietz, who interviewed Andrea and was the state's sole mental health expert in this case, he's the only mental health expert that they called, testified that Andrea, although psychotic on June 20th, knew that what she did was wrong. Dr. Dietz reasoned that because Andrea indicated that her thoughts were coming from Satan, she must have known they were wrong. Like, okay, well, Satan's bad. Yeah. So you know what he's saying is wrong. That if she believed she was saving the children, she would have shared her plan with others rather than hide it as she did. That if she really believed that Satan was going to harm the children, she would have called the police or a pastor or would have sent the children away. And that she covered the bodies out of guilt or shame because she did not, like, put in a sheet over them yeah, after she Yeah, and her, like, them. waiting... For her husband to leave and stuff. So, like, yes. yeah, she did know what she was yeah, doing. Yeah, she knew she should not be doing this. Okay, the other big controversial part of this case comes from Dr. Dietz on a few cross-examinations. So, Andrea's counsel cross-examined him and asked, now you are, are you not, a consultant on the television program known as Law & Order? He actually was a consultant on two of them. Mm-hmm. They said, okay, did either one of those deal with postpartum depression or a woman's mental health? He says, as a matter of fact, there was a show of a woman with postpartum depression who drowned her children in the bathtub and was found insane and it was aired shortly before the crime occurred. The second mention of law and order came during Dr. Lucy Perrier's testimony. Dr. Perrier, a defense expert witness, was cross-examined by the state regarding her evaluation of Andrea because she was one of the psychologists who said she was insane. Mm Mm-hmm. The state specifically asked about her failure to inquire into whether or not Andrea had seen Law & Order. Dr. Perrier testified as followed. They said, you know she watched Law & Order a lot, right? She said, no, I didn't know that. They said, did you know that in the weeks before June 20th, there was a Law & Order episode where a woman killed her children by drowning them in a bathtub, was defended on the basis of whether she was sane or insane under the law, and the diagnosis was postpartum depression, and that in the program, the person was found insane, not guilty by reason of insanity. Did you know that? She said no. They said, if you had known that and had known that Andrea Yates was subjected to these delusions, not that she was the subject of a delusion of reference, but that she regularly watched Law & Order and may have seen that episode, would you have changed the way you went about interviewing her? Would you have interviewed whether she got the idea somehow that she could do this and not suffer in hell or prison? She said, I certainly wouldn't have asked her that question, no. He said, would you have, you didn't have to ask her that question, but could you have explored that? She said, if I had known she watched the show, I would have asked her about it, yes. So basically they're saying that, like. Like, could you have known this was going to happen? Yeah. Or, right. like, would you have explored the idea that maybe she planned this, mm-hmm. knowing that she could probably get off as insane. Right. Because she had just watched it. Like, she wasn't a victim of her mental delusions, but of the delusion of a TV show. Yeah. So. In his final argument at the guilt-innocent phase of the trial, Andrew's attorney referenced to Dr. Dietz's testimony by stating, or maybe even we heard some evidence that she saw some show on TV and knew she could drown her children and get away with it. The prosecutor in his final argument made the following reference to Dietz's testimony about the Law & Order episode. She gets very depressed. She goes into Devereaux. And at times, she says these thoughts came to her during that month. These thoughts came to her, and she watches Law & Order regularly. She sees this program. There is a way out. She tells that to Dietz, a way out. In March of 2002, a jury rejected the insanity defense after deliberating for only four hours and found her guilty. Although the prosecution had sought the death penalty, the jury refused that option. The trial court sentenced her to life imprisonment in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice with eligibility for parole in 40 years. So, the problem with that entire thing is that that Law & Order episode never existed. Dietz was misremembering and putting two episodes together about a mother driving into a lake and a mother killing her newborn. So this episode never existed. So Andrea could have never possibly right. seen it. They did not figure this out until after the jury already found her guilty, which is unfortunate. One of the producer of, producers of Law & Order, or a scriptwriter or something, actually called and was like, whatever he's referencing to does not exist. That's not a real thing. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. The court refused to grant a mistrial, but said they would read a stipulation to the jury that Dietz had testified that he gave a false statement regarding the Law and Order episode. So, in Andrew's motion for a mistrial, they're saying that the court was wrong not to immediately 
declare a mistrial because yes. Deet's testimony was definitely a deciding factor in her fate. As yeah. he was the only psychiatrist who stated that Andrea did, in fact, know right from wrong. And he admitted the testimony was wrong. Yeah. So. And he's saying that she saw this show and that's why she did it. Yes. That she wasn't actually crazy. Yeah. And the show doesn't exist. Yes, that's fucked up. Yeah. And the they asked the court to immediately declare a mistrial in that trial and they said no. But they would read it to the jury for sentencing or something. I don't know what's already over. What good does yeah. it do to read to the jury? So the court makes it clear that they're deciding less on the fact of whether or not the actual episode existed, but the fact that the incorrect testimony could have a large deciding factor on the guilty verdict given to Andrea. So according to the court documents, on they, they said no to the mistrial. She applies like to the other court to say, you yeah. need to do something about this. Yeah. That's what this is. The record reflects that the state used Dr. Deet's testimony twice. First, the state used the testimony to cross-examine Dr. Puryear, who had seen Andrea for several months while she was in the county jail, asking Dr. Puryear whether she knew that Andrea watched Law and & Order and whether she knew that there was an episode with that exact plot. In doing so, the state repeated those facts. Second, the state connected the dots in its final argument by juxtaposing Andrea's depression, her dark thoughts, watching Law and & Order, and seeing a way out. Thus, the state used Dr. Dietz's false testimony to suggest to the jury that the appellant patterned her actions after that Law & Order episode. So they're saying, yeah, his testimony doesn't need to be taken, like, as fact, but it had snowballed into, like, the basis of the entire argument yeah. of the state. Based right. on this one lie. The state argues that Dr. Dietz's testimony regarding the Law & Order order episode was not material or like important necessary pertinent i don't know why they use the word material for that but yeah whatever the state asserts that there is no reasonable likelihood that the testimony could have affected the judgment of the jury they bring absolutely nothing to back that up like That's, just trust us it wouldn't have mattered i disagree <laughs> but sure i'm inclined to say you're lying the court concluded that the testimony combined with the state's cross-examination of Dr. Puryear and closing argument was important. Like, you brought this up on two cross-examinations and you used it in yeah. your closing argument. It was, in fact, very important. Yes, played a huge role. <laughs> yes. The materiality of the testimony is further evidenced by the fact that the appellant's attorney, Andrew's attorney, felt compelled to address it in his own closing argument. So he's like, well, now I have to address yeah, this. Yeah, they act like he just, like, <laughs> said it in passing and, like, yeah. it was not a big deal. No. Like, this was a huge piece of... Everyone ran with it. Yeah. Well, there we go. The smoking gun. Yeah. Like, the... The state also asserts that Dr. Dietz did not suggest that the appellant use the plot of the show to plan killing her children. And although it is true that he did not make such a suggestion, his bringing it up had, like, the state make That's, that suggestion. Yes. The Snowball. Five mental health experts testified that Andrea did not know right from wrong or that she thought what she did was right. Dr. Dietz was the only mental health expert who testified that Andrea knew right from wrong. Therefore, his testimony was critical to establish the state's case. Although the record does not show that Dr. Dietz intentionally lied in his testimony, his false testimony undoubtedly gave greater weight to his opinion. Yep. On the other hand, had the jury known prior to their deliberations in the guilt-innocent phase of the trial that Dr. Dietz's testimony regarding the law or episode was false, the jury would have likely considered him, the state's only mental health expert, to be way less credible. Yeah. They would have been like, okay, well, this man doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> they concluded that there is a reasonable likelihood that Dr. Dietz's false testimony could have affected the judgment of the jury. They and because he's the only one who said the only that one. she did know right from wrong. Yes. The only one. Like, that should, like... <sighs> Doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, it doesn't. They further conclude that Dr. Dietz's false testimony affected the substantial rights of Andrea. Therefore, the trial court abused its discretion in denying her a motion for a mistrial. They then reversed the prior judgment and sent it back for a new trial because you can't just mistrial yeah. and trial. It's already over. On January 9th, 2006, Andrea again pleads not guilty by reason of insanity. On February 1st, she is released on bail. Damn. Um, under the condition that she leaves prison to immediately go to a mental health facility. So since it's a new trial, she doesn't really need to be in jail anymore because yeah. like, they don't know if she's guilty or innocent right. yet. But just like doesn't get to like walk free. Yeah. So on February 2nd, she leaves the Harris County Jail and is voluntarily admitted to the Rusk State Hospital for psychiatric treatment. Her new trial began on June 26, 2006. The trial lasted exactly a month. 
The jury deliberated for three days, totaling almost 13 hours, and found Andrea not guilty by reason of insanity. Probably the right choice. Mm -hmm. They maintained that her mental illness preceded the death of the children, and they did not think that she was a dangerous threat to society, which is probably true. She literally just thought her children were evil, which could have been fixed with medicine. She's not, like, inherently evil and insane. Yes. She was just very fucked up. Because it's proven that when she is... Getting the right treatment yes. and on the right medication, she can fully <laughs> She's function. a functioning human, a functioning mother. Um, Russell Yates told reporters outside of the courthouse that we're happy. To me, this is really about Andrea's quality of life. To me, this is really about Andrea's quality of life for the balance of her life. Is she going to spend her time in a prison cell with barely adequate medical treatment and no interaction with other people and family members? Or is she going to spend time in a hospital and get good medical treatment and have hope of possibly somewhat normal life later Mm -hmm. andrea appeared shocked and sat wide-eyed with her lips slightly parted a state district judge belinda hill asked each juror individually shortly after noon whether they agreed with the verdict the verdict means she will be sent to a state mental hospital for treatment rather than be sentenced to life in prison like i said she just doesn't she's not like a free woman now it's like not guilty she just will live her life she had to like there were certain stipulations yeah. of this, like, you have to be there. You get, like, a yearly check-in or something until they decide that you don't have to be there. It's, so it's like, technically prison, but she's not in jail. She's, like, yeah. getting the help that she needs. That she needed long before. Yeah. Since January 2007, Andrea has been at Kerrville State Hospital, a mental facility in Kerrville, Texas. Although she was remanded to the mental facility more than 15 years ago, she can undergo a review every year to see if she's competent to leave the facility. As of 2022, Andrea opts each year to waive her right to be reviewed. She has never undergone a review, choosing instead to continue treatment. Details of her treatment have never been released. She's probably terrified to not be there. Yeah. Uh, her defense attorney, George Parnon, keeps in contact with her and says that she's very happy there. She's where she wants to be. She's where she needs to be. And he says, like, and where would she go? What would she do? Exactly. Like She's lived here the whole time. Yeah, I feel like that's probably where she needs to be. Yeah, so she doesn't even allow them to even see if she can. Yeah, it's not even like, like they're I don't saying want to that anyways. she can and she doesn't. She's, she doesn't even want to know. She's like, you don't even need to waste your time because I'm not leaving. Yeah. Parnum previously told people that Yates grieves for her children every day, often watching home videos of the kids. She also spends her time making aprons, cards, and gifts in the craft room and anonymously selling them. The money goes to the Yates Children Memorial Fund, which was founded by her lawyer and his wife, dedicated to women's mental health, particularly postpartum mental health. She does not ever leave the hospital. Her team had submitted a request in 2014 for her to have permission to go out on supervised outings, but withdrew that request because her health history would have been public record through the court system. So actually, it's not that worth it. Yeah, We'll just just stay here. I'm about done. Just some few catch-up things. Homicidal ideation was added to the warning label of the antidepressant drug Effexor as a rare adverse event in 2005. Andrea, she had said, had been taking 450 milligrams, twice the recommended maximum dose, for a month before killing her children. 450 milligrams? Yeah. For an entire, the entire month before she killed her children. Holy shit. Yeah. So, they added that warning label on there. In oh my God. August of 2004, Rusty actually filed for a divorce, mm. stating that he and Andrea had not lived together as a married couple since the day of the murders. Yeah. That makes <laughs> yeah. sense. Yeah. The divorce was granted on March 17, 2005, after which Rusty began dating his second wife, Laura Arnold. They married on March of 2005. 2005. March of March 25th is what I'm <laughs> trying to say. <laughs> And I couldn't figure out what was wrong. (laughs) They married on March 25th, 2006. Oh, okay. They had one son, um, and she ended up filing for a divorce from him in 2015. Huh, so. Well, Rusty discussed the tragedy in an interview with Oprah Winfrey, revealing that he still calls his ex-wife once a month and visits her annually in the mental hospital where she resides. That's good. I think they remained very close friends. They talk about the children together and stuff. Like, very normal. As normal as it can be. Right. Um, Warren Eckie was never really involved in the trial and maintains that he didn't influence Andrea in any way, which I just don't buy. Me either. You had her convinced 
her children were going to hell. Her biggest fear, her children going yeah. to hell. There's nothing and worse for someone like that. Yeah, exactly. And he told her it was her fault. Yep. Because of what you're doing, no fault of their own, they have to go to hell. Whatever. Both Rusty and Michael Warnecke reject these accusations. Rusty said that his family's relationship with the Warneckes was not that close and that he did not cause her delusions. Warnecke maintained that his correspondence with them was with the intention of helping them strengthen their marriage and find the love that he says his own family had found in Jesus. Both men agreed that the alleged connection between his message and her mental state was nothing more than media-created fiction. The adherence of the Yates family to the principles of the quiverful lifestyle, which encourages couples to have many children, has been posted as a factor contributing to the mental and emotional stress that she experienced. Again, some sources had suggested the lack of community may have also contributed mm-hmm. to her isolation. I feel like my mouth is doing very weird things, but the words are still coming out just a little right, mm-hmm. so I don't understand what's happening. This is my life <laughs> all of the time. David De La Isla, who followed Waranaki's teachings for 12 years, says Waranaki was a powerful influence on the vulnerable mind of Andrea Yates. He says in her thinking she was doomed to hell, her kids were going to hell, and that the only way she could save them was by killing them. He had convinced her of that. Yeah. De La Isla, like Russell Yates, met Waranaki as a college student. He became very depressed and even tried to commit suicide. After a 1995 face-to-face encounter with him, which resulted in his own damnation, the preacher told him that he was going to hell, despite his believing in Jesus and other intensive efforts at salvation. See, I... So this man was like, I have been in that exact position. He You can't just tell people they're going to... You don't get to decide. No. Like, that's what I don't understand is how... uh, And you can't just tell people who genuinely care if they go to hell or not that they're going to hell. That's their biggest fear. Literally. Like, they're living their life to not go Go to to hell. hell. And you're telling them it does not (laughs) matter if they're going to. I was doing everything right. Like, I was trying to save my soul. I believed in Jesus. And he was like, you're going to hell. doesn't matter. (laughs) So, yeah. I thought that guy came up a lot more when I remembered this, but he really didn't. But I feel like it is a large reason of why this happened. I think she always had these underlying mental illnesses. I think yes. that preyed on that to her. Absolutely. Because I feel like, especially with the kind of mental illness she had, like, she she's going to cling to something, yeah. like, obsessively like yeah. that. Like, she, her mind is just yeah. open for you to put whatever ideas in there. Exactly. And Rusty's telling her how great this man is. Like, and she's like, right. well, it must all be true. Yeah, it must all be true. Yeah, I... So, yeah. So, like, with the Lindsay Clancy thing, people are saying, like, she was an outpatient. Mm-hmm. Like, she shouldn't have been. Like, yeah. That's when this stuff happens. I just don't think it gets taken seriously enough. No, not at all. Like, not at all. It's crazy. Like, I feel like people just think, like, you're depressed or sad, but, like... There are things in your body going on that are, like, affecting, like, your like, actual health. Like, and sometimes, like, the thoughts in your head, like, scare you. Yeah. Like, especially after, like, your hormones are crazy. Exactly. And I can't imagine, like, with all those fucking kids. Yeah. And like, your boss. Yeah. With your preacher telling you that you're doing your best, but they're going to hell. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think she was insane. I also think she's, I'm glad she's had a mental health. She did not need to go to jail. No. She obviously committed a very heinous crime. She should crime, have been but. in a mental health facility long, long, yes. long before. She should not have been a Clearly, because she's completely fine in there. Which, like, I think that's, the, like, if you're a danger to yourself or others, yes. you need to be somewhere where you can't Yeah, they kept do anything. letting her go. Yeah, I don't. I think even Rusty was like, I don't think I like him. Like, during the trial, before they got divorced, like, at the very beginning... He was even saying things like he couldn't wait to have more children with her when, like, she was like, she can't have more children. No. It's ruining her life. Yeah. That's, I just came across, like, on Facebook, there was this thing about this woman who experienced postpartum psychosis, but, like, she ended up getting help, but, like, it has really affected her. Like, she couldn't leave the house, like, bad. Like, got straight up agoraphobia, like, and she had all these terrible thoughts. Yeah. But, like, thank God she said something, and thank God people took it seriously. Exactly. Andrea said something, and they're like, uh. Her husband was like, she has to be in the hospital. He, like, told them. Yeah. Like, she can't be at home. Yeah. With my children. You need to take her. Yeah. That's insane. So, yeah. She's going to be there probably forever. I don't see any reason why she would leave. Right. 
It's just crazy. It is crazy. It's, it's sad. Like, it's sad. That it's sad she, to think of, like, when she's coming out of this, like, on medication. She, she has, has to, to deal come with that to grief. Terms with yeah. what she did. And that's, like, not something that you can live with no and it's not like a normal where you know you're committing a crime and you know you're gonna feel bad about it she didn't know what she was doing no she She thought she was doing something good her mind was not in the right state no so like a year now like when it is and she's like i can't imagine like like, having to wake up every day like wow i was thinking that like she has to sit there sometimes and be like i can't believe i did that yep like because she's out of that state of mind now so like now i can't imagine removed from it no. Having to look back and think that. Thank God for therapy because how do you even work through something like that? I'd want she like, my failed. memory erased. <laughs> Same. Every step of the way. Yeah, she was. They So much could have been done for that to not happen. Yeah. It's so sad. Everyone saw it coming. Yep. It probably was not that shocking to everyone involved. So that's what, like, I can't stand the argument is that, like, if you're a mother, you should, like, you should never, I, cause I came across this TikTok where people were like, after the Lindsay Clancy thing, telling like the intrusive thoughts they have had. Yeah. It's not the same. And people, but then someone like reposted it and said like, I can't believe you guys are admitting to having these thoughts. Yeah. Like shaming them for yeah. saying, but like, but it, I mean, it was crazy things, but like sometimes your brain really does just put these wild thoughts. Yeah. Like. Your baby is crying and you think, wow, I could just put like a pillow over your face. Yeah. And it would stop. Yeah. Like, but then you immediately feel guilty after yeah. you think something like that. Like, why did I think that? But like, yeah. But some people don't. It doesn't snap doesn't, out for them. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think you can shame anyone for anything that they say if they're like, I know it is wrong. Yeah. No, That's the no, thing no. is like. You can determine if it's right or wrong. I thought you were talking about like people it. trauma dumping their stupid no, thoughts. No, 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 no. It was like a bunch of different people. Like someone had made yeah. one that said their intrusive thoughts. And then like a bunch of people were commenting on it. Like, like saying, oh yeah. my God, I can't believe like other, other people yeah. have experienced this. I thought like I was actually insane. <laughs> yes. And then like someone duetted it and was like, why the fuck are you guys saying this out loud? Like you're a mother. You should never oh, have God. thoughts like that. You shouldn't have kids then. Like, you're okay. um, the problem. <laughs> yeah, you're the Nobody problem. Nobody in their right mind wants to hurt their child. Nobody. Nobody. I mean, there are evil people, yeah. obviously, out yeah. there. But, like, in cases like this, people she who are did not that, want to do that. Yeah. Like, <sighs> mental health just isn't taken seriously enough. Still. Never. And they, they always say, like, mental health matters. But, like, no one cares. No one's helping no, these people. Not at all. It's so stupid. Anyway, that's what happened to Andrea Yates. Yep. I'm glad she's not in prison. Me too. That would be terrible. And I hope she gets to spend her afterlife with her children. I also hope that for her. I hope they're in heaven and she gets to go to heaven. Me too. I mean, I'm certain her children are in heaven. I mean, I don't really know. I don't don't know know. the requirements. I don't know what's out there. I don't know where they are, but I hope in another (laughs) life she gets to be with them. Me too. <sighs> that was a good one. I've never really like fully, yeah, let, like knew everything about that. Honestly. All right, it's nap time, folks. It sure <laughs> is my favorite time of the day. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Almost Pod. If you want an additional episode every week, you can find us at Patreon at Almost Pod. If you have a case you want us to cover, throw it in a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find merch and all other information at bitchpackmedia.com. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.